later. Okay, good afternoon. This is Monday, February 1, and it's our class session. February is here, which means winter's days are numbered, but it's still pretty chilly out there today. It's 28 degrees, so I took a walk this morning. We are in the middle of discussing probability and just trying to understand the fundamental concepts. And we're gonna do several examples today by playing some games with dice, cards, coins, anything that we need to do. And then we'll show you ways to organize and count your probabilities effectively. That's what's on tap for this week. Let me share screen to show our website for this week, just to give you an idea. Let me get a window that we can use here. Okay, put it over there. Got it, got it. Stop that, share that. Okay, here we go. So I'm just looking at my generic browser window here, but let's go to our website. And we'll look at Mass 208. I want to look at the overall schedule here because I just want to tune you in that you have an exam that we're going to do coming up, not this week, not next week, but two weeks from this week. So we'll start to talk more about that as we go along. You see that we cut the course into three sections, essentially, right up here up to section 5.1, review exam. Remember there's a spring break week in there that interrupts us, then up to section 10.5, review exam. And then up to section 13.4, review exam. Each of those sections, the exam deals only with those sections. And we're not even doing every single section in the book. So this list of our calendar here is exactly what sections will be covered on tests. The tests only deal with those, section, those sections in the book that are from that section of the course. There's no comprehensive thing I'm doing here. But my plan is to go through next week covering up to section 5.1 and you're practicing in the Newton Alt to Homework 2. And I will probably have on Monday a review session here on the video that you're welcome to come and attend and ask questions. And then after that review session, we'll release this exam. And we can talk more about how many questions are gonna be on it. It's not gonna be an overly long exam, like 20 questions or something. Oh, usually I envision six to eight questions on this exam. I think you might consider it like five, six, seven, eight problems that look like your homework problems. And then I'll give you several days to hand in. And then we'll get back to work on the next section the following week. So I'll be more specific about that next week, exactly how many problems, uh, you know, how long do you have to do it? In my mind right now, I'm, you know, anticipating 48 hours or something like that to do the exam and then submitted like you're submitting your homework as a PDF file. So this week we're going up to section three, six. Our work in chapter three began last week and we're just talking about probability. The reason why we're talking about probability is because we do acknowledge that when we are going to do a sampling of a population, those are two statistics words in one sentence, population, a very large group of people, sampling means picking a subgroup of those and trying to learn something about the whole population 
from the sample. You know, typical thing would be, I'd like to know how voters are gonna vote on this bond issue in Saginaw County. And there might be 80,000 voters in Saginaw County. How many registered, I don't know. But I cannot ask the 80,000 voters how they intend to vote next week. I can just wait for the vote to come out, but I'd kind of like to know ahead of time. So I poll a sample of them, but when I take a sample of them, I acknowledge that you know maybe I just accidentally picked the people that wouldn't support the bond issue more often than the others or the other way around. So the idea of taking a small sample of a large population naturally involves probability. So we gotta understand some of the rules of probability in order to understand whether what we're doing later with our samples is legitimate or not. So the two most important things that we can talk about when we're talking about probability is how do two inter how do two events interact? Oh, so I'm not back to my paper yet. I'll go back to my paper in a second. Let's go to week four and just remind you that we have the outline for what we're doing. Today we'll do examples out of three, three, and three, four. Next time three, five. And three, six is kind of a fun experiment with M and M's. And I'll walk through that experiment with you. We can do it together. If you want to have a bag of M&Ms handy while you're going through this with me or while you're watching the video later, be my guest. Uh, you can also simulate this on a calculator computer. I did this with beans, and I mean navy beans, lima beans, kidney beans, garbanzo beans, black beans. And the reason why is if I did it with M&Ms, I would just eat the M&Ms and get sick. So you, you can do it with M&Ms if you got the self-control. You can do it with anything that's got these four or six different colors in a plentiful enough numbers. But uh, yeah, go ahead and use M&Ms, bring M&Ms to class Wednesday and we'll play with them. Your homeworks that you're working on, you're working on a homework tonight, uh, not for tomorrow night, and that bothers me that it's lit up on the previous week, but it is not lit up on this week. So why didn't I do that? So here's homework number three that you're working on this week. I think I do have it on my week four page. I just didn't refresh the page. Let's go back to the week four page, refresh and see what we got here. No, I don't have it there. So let's make sure I got it there. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to go up. Yeah, if you ever see something not turned on on my page, yeah, maybe I just didn't upload it properly. So just send me a note, Dave, that homework's not turned on. OK, here we go. There's homework three right there. And that's due tomorrow night. Okay, so let's just have some fun doing some probability experiments right now. Go back to my paper, and I picked out some ordinary problems. Let's call 85, 86, 96, 100, 112. These are problems from these two sections. So remember some basic facts about probability. The word sample space is really the collection of all things that can happen. This is in your reading last week. An event is a combination of some of the things that can happen. It could be just one of the things 
drawing the ace of spades from a standard deck. But I could say a combination of one or some of the events. or of the things that can happen. And we generally use capital letters like A, E, B, C, any, any kind of capital letters for an event. So events are often denoted A, B, E, you know, C, X, you know, drawing the ace of spades, drawing a red card, getting heads four times in a row. I use these generic letters to stand for that. And when I say probability of A, I mean, excuse me, let me shift my paper up the likelihood or probability that the event A happens. Now, I'll give you some very simple examples here. If I just take from my deck of cards handy next to me. I'll take two cards right there, ace of spades and the ace of hearts, <coughs> and I'll mix them up and turn them over. Mix them up, there we go. One of those cards is red and one of those cards is black. So I could say my sample space is Pick the red card, pick the black card. The sample space, the collection of all the things that could happen is either picking the red card or the black card. And the event would be, I win if I pick the black card. Let's turn this card over. Okay, it just happens that it's black, I win. Doing the experiment here is not doing the math. I'm just visualizing doing the experiment with you. Probabilities are naturally always between zero and one. And when you say the probability of something is zero, that means A is impossible. Or I could say it like this way, A cannot happen. When you say the probability of something is one, then you are saying A is certain. Or another way of saying this, A must happen. But most probabilities are trapped somewhere between zero and one. Let me add another red card to my deck. And I have two red cards and one black card. When I shift them around and then lay them on the table and ask you what's the probability of choosing the black card, there's three black cards here and one of them is black. If I just pick one of these cards at random, the probability of picking the black card is one third. I would not say the probability of black, picking the black card is one because I know there are two red cards here. And there's no way that I must pick the black card. I also wouldn't say the probability of picking the black card is zero because I know there is a black card on the table. And so it's not impossible for me to pick a black card. I'm just gonna take the one in the middle. Oh, I lose, it was red. Okay, so these are the basic fundamental steps of probability. Now the problem becomes when we start to mix things together, what happens if we have two events that are happening together? Drawing a king and drawing a red card. Uh, 
rolling a six with two dice and both of the dice are even numbered. You know, sometimes one event could influence another event. Uh, let's say something, you know, just silly and political. I don't know if it's true. Supporting the bond issue in Saginaw is more likely if you're a Republican. I don't know if that's true or false. But if it's the case that the Republicans support the bond issue more than the Democrats, whatever the bond issue is for, then knowing that you're speaking to a Republican, perhaps, will change your opinion of whether that person supports the bond issue or not. If Republicans support the bond issue more than Democrats and you're speaking to a Republican, then which way would you bet? You would bet that that person supports the bond issue. Maybe they don't. But when two events influence or have the possibility of influence each other, they're called dependent. And if two events do not influence each other, they're called independent. Now, sometimes two events cannot happen at the same time. I rolled two dice and I get a 12. Now there, I just rolled two dice and I did not get a 12. But let's pretend I got a 12. Let me find the 12. And one of the dice had a three on it. Well, that's not going to happen with a standard six-sided dice. It is impossible to both have one dice with a three and have the two dice add to 12. When two events cannot possibly happen at the same time, then they're called mutually exclusive. And in section 3.2, we went over the definition of independent and mutually exclusive in our recording. We did it very briefly, too briefly. That's why we're going to practice it again today. In the book, they explained it well. Okay, so we are concerned about how we combine events. So here's the basic way we can combine events. We could ask for the probability of A and the probability of B. And then we could ask, what's the probability that A happens and B happens? Or we could ask, what's the probability that A happens or B happens? Notice you can also ask questions like, what's the probability that A does not happen? Uh, in the book, they use this apostrophe after the A. The probability that I rolled a six on one dice, that happens to be one out of six and I just accidentally rolled a six. So what's the probability that I do not roll a six? Well, I do not roll a six is the other five sides, right? So when you see someone in this book write A with a prime next to it or an apostrophe next to it, they mean the probability that A does not happen. If the probability of rolling a six is one out of six, then what's the probability of not rolling a six? Maybe I should put the word roll six and not roll six. That's a little bit too small to read. Probability of not rolling a six out of five out of six. Notice that's the same as one minus the probability of rolling a six. So now you have a formula 
for the probability of something does not happen, it'll be the opposite or one minus the probability that it does happen. So we got this idea of probability of A prime, probability of A and B, probability of A or B. There's one more that's very useful, probability of A given B. When someone writes probability of A in a vertical bar and a B, they mean the probability that A happens given that B happens. Or people shorten this generally to probability of A given B. What is the probability that the person you're talking to supports the bond issue given that they're a Democrat? What is the probability of the person you're talking to supports the bond issue given that they're a Republican? Those probabilities may be different. So combining events can happen in several ways. I could take the opposite of event. I could take the combination of an event. I win if both A and B happen. I could take the combination of event A and B saying I win if A or B happens. Or I could take the combination like I win if A happens after B happens. Now, the definitions that we're working with today before we do some actual problems, there's formulas for computing each of these. Remember I just said to you, the probability that something does not happen is equal to one minus the probability that it does. So if you know the probability of rolling a six is one out of six, then the probability of not rolling a six is five out of six. If you want to know the probability of A and B happening, then what you really need to know is the probability that B has happened given times the probability that A has happened given that B has happened. So B happened and then A happened. Or A happened and then B happened given that A happened. Both of these sentences are equal to the probability of A and B. Usually, I use the A and B probability as a way to calculate these conditional probabilities. The probability of A given B and the probability of B given A are called conditional probabilities. And if I turn those sentences around, I could say it like this. The probability of A given B, divide both sides by probability of B here, is the probability of A and the probability of B, probability of A and B, both happening at the same time, divided by the probability that B happens by itself. I could rewrite this term, probability of B happens given A, is the probability of B and A divided by the probability of A. Notice the probability of A and B and the probability of B and A are the same. If I say you flip a coin and pick a card out of the deck and you win if the coin is heads and the card is red, that would be the same thing as winning if the 
card is red, then the coin is heads. So when you use the word and, you could express those in either order. But when you do the conditional probability, you cannot express those in either order. The difference is in the denominators. The probability of A or B happening. Let's say you win if you flip a coin and get heads, or you pick the card out of the deck and get red. So you win with heads or red. What's your probability of winning then? The formula goes like this. The probability of A plus the probability of B. But you have to subtract the probability that they could happen at the same time. So let's say A is flip coin, get heads. Let's say B is choose card from standard 52 card deck and get red. Now it's a fact that you believe your probability of getting heads is one out of two. It doesn't mean that when you flip a coin a thousand times, you always get 500 heads and 500 tails. It's just you have a strong belief that you have an equal chance of getting a head and tail. That is if the coin is fair. Let's assume we're talking about a fair coin. Same thing with a deck of cards, 52 cards. If you believe, or if you've checked that 26 are red and 26 are black, then the probability of getting a red card is 26 out of 52, which also, by the way, is one half. But now let's play this game where you flip a coin and pick a card. Now the probability of getting a head is one half. The probability of getting a red card is one half. But no one listening to me thinks that they're going to win this game for sure. One half plus one half is one. But you know that you might pick a black card or get a tail when you flip the coin. So you know that if you pick a card and flip a coin, you're not guaranteed to get heads in red. So what went wrong with the one half plus one half? Because one half plus one half is one and one means it must happen. The problem with or is that I have to subtract the possibility that they could both happen So what's the probability that I can get a head and get a red card? That would also be winning. The idea is I can get a head and I can get a red card half the time and half the time. I can subtract these, I can get a quarter of the time because probability of getting a head and a red card equals one quarter because A and B are independent. That means the probability of A, probability of getting a red card, does not influence whether the coin comes up heads or tails. And where the coin comes up heads or tails does not influence whether the card is red or black. So let's do this experiment. So I'm claiming that if I play this game, draw a card, red or black, flip a coin, heads or tails, I'm gonna win three quarters of the time. 
75% of the time. Remember, you could also express that fraction as 0 0.7500. Four decimal places is a good idea when you're doing just standard probabilities. Okay, let's flip the coin. I got a tail. Let's pick the card. I got a black card. So I definitely lost. But according to my count, that should be rare. Let's try it again. There's a head, so I won. Turn over the card and it's red. Notice that once I have the head, I know that I won. I don't need to get a head and a red card. I win if I get a head or a red card. So now we've played this game twice and we've won once and lost once. So let's try it again. There's a tail, but I still might win. Let's turn over the card. It's black. I lost. Now I've got two losses and only one win. I don't want to believe that three-fourths anymore. Yeah, still I believe these two chances to win give me a good chance. Let's flip it again. Here's a head. Here's a black card. I still win. Now I've got two wins and two losses. I'll do it one more time. Flip the coin. It's a tail. Shuffle the cards, turn over the top card. It's a red, I win. Okay, very good. Now let's use this word. Theoretical probability and empirical probability. The theoretical probability of me winning that game was three out of four. That means every time I play four times, I better win three. The empirical probability of me playing that game, notice I played three, I played five times and I won three times. Because after two, I was two and two. I said, I'll try it again. Empirical probability, or some people call experimental probability, the experimental probability is what you observe when you repeat the experiment. many times. The theoretical probability is what you expect to happen based on the sample space, based on all the things that can happen is what you expect to happen when you consider the sample space. Okay. Two more words here, and then we can get started. So when you do A or B, you wish you could just add the probability of A and add the probability of B. But since A and B could happen at the same time, you have to take away that possibility that they could happen at the same time. It wasn't certain for you to win that dice and card game. But what if A and B can't happen at the same time? then the probability of A or B is just probability of A plus probability B. That would be a sweet shortcut. So when A and B cannot happen at the same time, then probability of A or B is just the sum of the two. So when A 
and B cannot both happen. And that's called A and B are mutually exclusive. then the rule for A or B shortens into a nice compact form. Instead of probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A and B, the probability of A or B becomes simply the probability of A plus the probability of B. I've got a room filled with Democrats, independents, and Republicans. What's the probability that the person I'm talking to is a Democrat or a Republican? Those things aren't going to happen at the same time. Let's just say they don't happen at the same time commonly in politics. So I can take the probability that I'm talking to a Republican plus the probability that I'm talking to a Democrat and I could just add them up. Let's say I have four Republicans in the room, five Democrats, and one independent. The probability of me talking to a Republican, if I pick someone at random, is 40%, four out of 10. Two out of five, if you reduce it. Probability of me pick talking to a Democrat is five out of 10, one half. So what's the probability of me talking to a Republican or a Democrat, that person I'm talking to? I win if she is a Republican or a Democrat. Well, actually, I have a very good chance of winning, right? Probability of me talking to the person and she is a Republican is four tenths. The probability of me talking to the person and she is a Democrat is five tenths. I should subtract the probability that this person is both a Republican and a Democrat, but I'm expecting that that's impossible. I, that doesn't mean that people can't act one way today and act a different way tomorrow. But let's just assume that right now at this party, someone can't simultaneously be a Republican and a Democrat. Since I'm subtracting zero out of 10, I don't even have to consider that. My probability of talking to Republican or Democrat is clearly nine out of 10. Now, if you don't watch this video, you just see these R's and D's and I's on the paper. That's not very helpful. So I understand you need to watch video for the explanation. Since some people might just be downloading this paper, I'm going to write that here. Watch the video for example explanation. Okay, can I shorten P of A and B? According to our formula, that's the probability of B happens times the probability of A happens given that B happens. And that looks kind of awkward. I would just like to multiply them together like the heads on the coin and the red card. What was special about the heads and the coin and the red card that we just discussed? They were independent. So can I shorten or simplify this formula?
And the answer is yes. If A and B are independent, independent, that means one, does not influence the likelihood of the other. Sorry, I have to move my paper up. Then the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A. Knowing that B happened does not change the probability of A. So in that case, I can write the probability of A and B is the probability of B times the probability of A because the probability of A given B is the probability of A. And that's a very cool shortcut. I used that a second ago on the cards and the coin. What's the probability of getting a red card? What's the probability of getting heads on a coin? Choosing the card does not change whether this coin can be heads or tails. And choosing whether this coin is heads or tails does not influence what color card I pick. Those are independent events. Sometimes it's not easy to recognize if two events are independent or not. Now notice also the probability of A and B or B and A, because I can write it either way, is the probability that B happens, or sorry, that A happens given There are times the probability that B happens given that A happens. So again, if B and A are independent, this probability is just P of A times P of B. If A and B are independent. I wrote that too small and too close to the edge of the paper, I apologize, are independent. Okay, that's too much words. I mean, number the papers, let's do a problem. So for the first problem, let's pick 86 in your book. And 86 says, and I'm going to number this page number four. This is the problem from section 3.3, number 86. It says you have eight cards. And the problem has green and yellow cards. The problem is I do not have green and yellow cards. I only have black and red cards. So let's say five black cards. With an ace, two, three, four, or five. Let's call the ace one here. Sometimes when you're playing games with cards, you can let the ace be a one or you can let the ace be an 11. Let's call the ace a one in this game. One, two, three, four, five. Let's take three red cards. And let's likewise have them labeled ace, two, and three. One, two, and three. I just happened to prepare those cards already over here. So you see that I have five black cards, one, two, three, four, five. I have three red cards, one, two, three. 
Now, remember, I'm doing problem 85. Sorry, 85. But I don't have green and yellow cards. So the black cards are taking the place of the green cards. The red cards are taking the place of the yellow cards. The ace is taking the place of one. So what's the probability? Let me leave the cards spread out here while I write. He asks you some questions. What's the probability that you choose a black card? He says green, but I'm making black equal to green here. Well, it's reasonable enough to count. I have five black cards. I have eight cards in total. The probability is five eighths. If you want to convert that to a decimal, and I don't think that's a bad idea, be 0 0.6250. You can just take your calculator. And do five divided by eight. I won't do that in front of you. I'll just say you could take your calculator. It's nice to express five eighths as a decimal. Often when you're talking about probabilities, it's not bad to write decimal. We use at least four digits here. Let's make a rule that we're gonna use four digits, four decimal places unless they tell us otherwise. Four digits after the decimal place. That's called four decimal places. See, this says that if you pick a card, you're going to win 62.5% of the time. And that's quite believable. If I mix up these cards right here, you know there are more black than red. So if I take one off the top, I don't expect to choose a red. I expect more often to choose a black. Now, I don't play this game eight times and look for five wins, but let's try it. Okay, one win, one loss. Six more times. Oops, one win, two losses. Cut, cut again. Okay, two wins, two losses. I've played four times and I've come up even. Oh, now I've played five times, three wins. Six times, four wins. Seven times, four wins and three losses. This would be too good to be true, but here's the eighth time. Four wins, four losses. According to what we just did, the empirical probability is 50%. But none of you playing cards with this hand that I'm holding would bet equally on red and black. Anyone who is putting down money would say, I'm going to put down money on picking a black card because there are clearly more black cards in the deck. Okay. Now, what's the probability of picking a black card given that the number on the card is even? So I shuffle the cards again. I take one off the top. I say to you, oh, what's the probability of that being black? You say five eighths. But if I look underneath, and see that it's also an even number. Does that change what you believe? Okay, let's say that again. You know the probability of getting a black card is five out of eights. Five eights, 62.5%. But I put this card down and before I tell you whether you win or lose, I tell you it's even does that change what you believe? And by the way, this card is even. Does that improve your chance of winning? Does it damage your chance of winning? Well, let's calculate. And I kept that card on the top, just in case you want to see it later. So the probability of B given E, probability of being black, given that it's even, is the probability of it being black and being even, 
divided by the probability of being even. Now let's look at those two probabilities. I have how many cards? Eight cards. How many are even? The two, the four, and the two. Only three of the eight cards are even. So the probability that I pick an even card is three eight. How many of the cards are black and even? The black cards are these five across the top. There are five black cards, two of them are even. So I have two cards out of the eight that are black and even. So let's calculate two eights divided by three eighths. You know how to multiply fractions. And you know how to divide fractions. When I tell you that that card is even on the top, do you see what happened? It just improved your chances of winning. It took your chances of winning to two thirds. 0.6667, in other words, 66.7% or 66.67%. So are these two events independent? And the answer is no, because when I tell you this card is even, I've just brightened your face because you now have a better chance of this card being black if you were betting on the card being black. So this is how I calculate the and, and the probability of E. This is how I calculate the conditional probability. By the way, let me turn over this card because I was telling you the truth, it is even, but it turned out to be red. So you lost, which is a one in third possibility because the card being red, given that it was even, was a possibility of one third because the probability of it being black given that it was even was two thirds. Okay, next case. What's the probability of it being black and even? Well, we just calculated that. How many of these eight cards are both black and even? Two out of eight, which is one fourth. You are not gonna enjoy that game. If I say you win, if you pick a card that's black and even, the probability of one fourth is not very enticing. Still, I picked the black and even card. Do you see what I'm trying to illustrate when I play the games with you? There is no doubt that the probability of getting a black and an even is not easy. It's not gonna happen a lot. The probability is two out of eight, 25% of the time. Only 25% of the time you're gonna win. But that doesn't mean in any one game, I can't win. Let's turn over this card. Just because I only win 25% of the time in this game, does that mean this card cannot be a black and even card? No, because if it couldn't be that, it would be 0%. I do have a chance of winning. And that's what we mean by chance. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. This time, it did not happen. I turned over a black card, but it was not even. Okay. Next, what is the probability of being black or being even? Now, what is that? The probability of being black plus the probability of being even minus the probability of being black and even. Now the probability of being black is five out of eight. The probability of being even, we've already calculated, is three out of eight. And you say, wow, I'm guaranteed to win because that adds up to one. Say, no, 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 you gotta remember some cards are black and even. And what's the probability of 
card being black and even. Two out of eight. So I've got to take away those two cases where they both happen. Still, I kind of like my odds. Eight out of eight minus two out of eight is six out of eight, or three quarters, or 75%. If I'm playing this game at the casino, eight cards, three red, five black, numbered from one to five. If I'm playing this game, I win if the card is black or even, then I'm liking my chances. I'm going to win three out of four times. That's what I expect. Me, I'm a naturally unlucky person. So if I turn over that top card there, somehow I don't have great confidence in myself. Look at that. It was both red and a one odd. So I just lost. And you're not gonna make me feel better by saying, well, you should win 75% of the time, Dave. No, 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 I just lost. So remember, theoretical probability is different from observed or experimental probability. If I played this game 100 times, I bet you I'd come close to winning 75 times, about. But I don't have time to play it 100 times. Maybe I could have a computer play it 100 times. Maybe I could have 100 people each play it once. Maybe I could have 20 people play it five times. And I could do a big, big experiment. But simply my little experiment here, I had a 30, I had a three out of four chance of winning, and I lost. I'm just going to do it again. See how very, very unlucky I am. OK, I win if it's black or even. Okay, today I won. Notice it's both black and even, but I don't care. I would have been happy if that was a black three. Okay, good. So here's the next question. Are black and even mutually exclusive? This is problem 85 still. Now you got to know the vocabulary. Mutually exclusive means cannot happen at the same time. And so if someone said, are black and even mutually exclusive, you'd have to say, no. They could easily happen at the same time. In the last game, I turned over a black even numbered card. Are black and even independent? Then you got to know what independent means. It means one does not influence the outcome of the other. Sorry, I'm going to raise my paper. No, they were not mutually exclusive. And no, they are not independent because the ordinary probability of drawing a black card was 62.5% or 0.625. But if you told me that the card was even, that changed the probability of the card being black. These two are not equal. The probability of being even changed probability of being black. The probability of being black changes the probability that the card is even. Isn't that true? 
the ordinary probability that the card is even is three out of eight. But if I tell you, and three out of eight is 0.375%, but if I tell you the card is black, that improves the chances of it being even. Two out of five, 40%. So if two events are dependent, then they're dependent in either way. Okay, so that's just a quick demonstration of dependent and mutually exclusive. Let's try one of the other problems I had listed there. Let's look at 96 or 100. Yeah, let me bring this onto the computer screen because here's a very cool problem and a very good way to organize information. So I'm gonna bring this on the computer screen by going to our book at openstacks.org. Uh, you have the book in paper form or you can just go to openstacks.org. The book is free online. Excuse me. So I'm gonna look under subjects, math, introductory statistics, there's our book. And now I'm gonna view it online. Oh, I apologize. I should share that screen with you. Let's do it from the start, sharing the screen with you. Because then you can see exactly what I see. So I just opened up a browser window, type openstacks.org. And looked for where I could choose the books right here. Uh, I could expand this window and I see subjects. Or if I didn't expand the window, for example, if I was on a phone, they got these three little bars here. Subjects, math, and we're in section 3.3. Go down to our statistics book, introductory statistics, view online, section 3.3. Table of contents, three, and homework problems. So practice and homework problems. I'm looking at a homework problem, 96 right now. Let's look at this. Okay, I like baseball. <laughs> so this is example. from section 3.3, number 96. And this is a important way to look at probability. So you're looking at this table with these numbers in front of you and you have some hitters, uh, famous, if you like baseball, famous players who are excellent hitters. They did very well hitting the ball. Uh, one of them was an excellent pitcher and that's Babe Ruth, but let's not talk about that right now. Babe Ruth was certainly famous for excellent hitter. He hit 714 home runs. Uh, Hank Aaron recently died and he was the home run king. He hit 755 home runs. I saw him hit the 755th home run. I only saw it on TV. Uh, you're going to talk about Barry Bonds. Didn't Barry Bonds have more than 75, 55? Yes, but technically Bonds has not been acknowledged as being the home run king, I believe, because of his uh, use of steroids. Okay, so let's not talk about morality, steroids, whatever. We're just talking about these four hitters. Now, in baseball, you got singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. That depends on you know, what kind of hit it was. Did you get one base, two base, three bases, or all four bases a home run? So some players were not excellent at hitting home runs like Jackie Robinson, but did have a fair amount of singles. Ruth had way more home runs and more singles. 
Now let's check this out. Ty Cobb had the least home runs, but he had the most hits. Now Ty Cobb was eclipsed by Pete Rose and Pete Rose was currently banned from the Hall of Fame, not for steroid use, but for betting on baseball. So again, we're not talking about morality, we're just talking about four hitters. So you know what everybody always says, like, oh, who's the best hitter of all time? Well, that depends on what you consider the best, right? How about the most hits? Ty Cobb was the best hitter of all time. How about the most home runs? Hey, Garen was the best hitter of all time. How about the most triples? Ty Cobb was the best. How about the most doubles? Hank Aaron. See, you can go back and forth on these things. And I cannot bring back these people. With the passing of Hank Aaron, all four of them have died. I can't bring them back and put them in the same stadium and have a contest. And even if I could, having lived at different times, you know, by the time Hank Aaron was in his prime, of course, Ty Cobb was older, couldn't hit a baseball, right? So I'm measuring them against different pitchers and different times and different ballparks. You know, I don't want to talk about who is the best. But I can answer a question like, is the hit being made by Hank Aaron and the hit being a double an independent event? So let's say HH is Hank got the hit. And let's say DH is a double. was the hit. Are those two things independent? Does changing who got the hit change what kind of hit it was? So the problem asks you this question. Is the pro is Hank Aaron got the hit? And a double was the hit? Are these independent? Now notice I had to invent letters for Hank Aaron got the hit and the double was the hit. That's because I don't want to write out Hank got the hit and double was the hit, right? So we're often abbreviating. It's okay to abbreviate as long as you tell people, as I did, what the abbreviation was. What does independent mean? Does the probability that Hank got the hit equal the probability that Hank got the hit given that a double was the hit? Let's calculate these two. The probability that Hank got the hit from the table. In the table, there are 12,351 hits total. And Hank Aaron got 3,771 hits. I'm reading in the last column, in the last two entries. Hank Aaron's total hits were 3,771. And the total hits of all these four people were 12,351. Now, what's the probability that Hank Aaron got the hit given that a double was the hit? According to our formula, that's the probability that Hank Aaron got the hit and a double was the hit he got divided by the fact that a double was the hit. So now I've shown you the page. You can look up the page. I'm going to go back to my paper.
So HH is Hank got the hit. DH is double was the hit. Is the events Hank got the hit and double was the hit. Are they independent? The probability that Hank got the hit is 3771 over 12351. It's messy, right? Because this is not an exact science. These are the total number of hits divided by the total number of hits that Hank Aaron got. This is an experimental probability. How about the probability that Hank got a hit and the hit was a double? Well, remember, Hank got 3,771 hits. How many of the hints that he got, how many of the hits he got were doubles? It's listed as 624. That's a pretty good size. In fact, Hank got the most doubles. What's the probability the double was the hit in general? According to the chart, and I'm going back to the chart, out of the total hits, 1,577 were doubles, and there were 12,351 hits. So are these two numbers the same? Well, this is a horrible mess. So I'm going to convert them to decimals. It's almost impossible to manipulate these by hand. Well, it would take us a long time. 3771 divided by 12351. This means that of those four people, the probability that Hank got the hit was 30 0.53%. Whereas if I take these two numbers, 624 divided by 3771, I get the probability that Hank got the hit and the double was the hit is 0.1655. Now that's rounded off and I do not want to round off. So I'll show you how I'll do that in my calculator. The probability that a double was the hit is 1577 divided by 12,351. That is 0 0.12768. Now the problem is this is Probability is going to be bigger than one. Something is wrong here. That's one out of six. That's one out of eight. This probability is bigger than one, and that's impossible. So what am I misreading here? Let me go back to my table and share the table with you, just so you can help me if you see what I did wrong. What's the probability that Hank got the hit? Hank had 3,000. 771 hits. Oh, and a double was the hit. So this would be 624 out of, that Hank Aaron got the hit. And the hit was a double. So I'm gonna be focusing on the doubles. That is 1577. My apologies. In that second column, it lists all the doubles. And out of the 1,577 doubles, Hank Aaron got 624 of them. Now, that's the and. Now the probability that the double was the hit. Then I go to the last row. There were 1,577 doubles out of 12,351 hits. That part is correct. So I have to rework this number. 624 divided by 1577. Okay, that's 0 0.395. I'm still in deep trouble. Okay, so that is not working. The phone is ringing in the background, it's distracting me. Let's do this carefully. 
the probability that Hank Aaron got the hit, I'll go back to my paper. Hank got the hit is a total number of hits, 12, 3, 5, 1, and Hank had 3,771 of them. The probability that Hank got the hit and the hit was a double. So I'm only looking in the doubles column. In the doubles column, how should I say that? That Hank got the hit was 624. That the hit was a double was 1557. So that means Okay, I should be putting the 12, I have these upside down. I should be putting the 12, let's just cross that out and rewrite it. What's the probability that Hank got the hit and the hit was a double divided by the probability that the hit was a double. The probability that Hank got the hit and the hit was a double Hank had 624 hits, but the table shows 12,351 hits total. In the top, I should be divided by 12,351. In the bottom, what's the probability that a double was the hit? There are 12,351 hits, and how many were doubles? 1,577. So this number, now I can return to the paper and get this straight. Sorry, I wasn't focusing on the table or the paper. This number, when I divide by 12,351 both ways, there's 624 of the 1,577 doubles belong to Hank Aaron. Now let's see what that number is. 624 divided by 1,577. And that is 3957, if I round off. These numbers are not the same. So the idea that Hank got the hit and the idea that the double was the hit are dependent. They are not independent. If I tell you that a double was the hit, that raised the chances that Hank had got the hit. And just, I'll go backwards. We got to end it here. I'll go backwards though, and show you something about the baseball table one more time. And if you're a baseball fan, you probably noticed this already. The people that got the most doubles were what? The people that had the most home runs. You know, frequently a double is a longer hit into the outfield that might bounce off the wall or go all the way to the wall before a fielder catches it or picks it up. So why is that true that home run hitters hit more doubles? Well, because a lot of the time home run hitters didn't clear the fence, but they bounced the ball off the fence or they drove the ball all the way to the fence. Whereas Ty Cobb hit very few home runs, but lots and lots of singles. And sometimes those singles stretched into doubles that they were down the line or evaded a fielder. He worked with his speed. Okay, we're not teaching a baseball history class. I want to say something else about this table before we go. When you present your data in a table like this, what does it help us do? It helps us decide whether events are independent or dependent. And so this table has a very formal and fancy name. It's called a contingency table. When you organize your data in a table, it makes it easier to calculate whether 
one variable or one event is dependent on another variable or another event. So in this case, I could tell that the idea that Hank got the hit and the idea that the hit was a double were not independent. Hank Aaron got a great deal of doubles, more by percentage than a Ty Cobb or Jackie Robinson. Okay, I'm going to cut it off there and upload this and put it away. So I'm going to say goodbye. We did some of the problems I wanted to do, not all of them. We can do more problems next time, but we're definitely going to show you contingency tables again. We're going to use them frequently. This chapter is showing you three ways to organize your work. Contingency tables, tree diagrams, and Venn diagrams. These are techniques you want to use if you want to organize information to decide if events are independent or dependent. The word contingent means dependent upon. You know, uh, your paycheck is contingent upon the number of hours you work, right? The size of your paycheck depends on the number of hours you work. So when someone says they're talking about a contingency table, they're trying to decide if two events are dependent on each other. Okay, you've been patient and I've kept you long enough. I'm gonna upload these. Sorry for the confusion right there. You have to be careful when you read these. It's hard to talk and do at the same time, but I can't use that as an excuse. Be very careful when you read and fill in these numbers. I'll upload all these papers. I'll get this recording posted and I'll see you again on Wednesday. You guys have a nice day.